you please pray with me? Loving God, we give you thanks for all the ways in which you speak to us. We pray that you would be with us now. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing to you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Our second reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 20, verses 27 through 38. And this can be found on page 84 in your pew Bibles. Some Sadducees, those who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and asked him a question. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife but no children, the man shall marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers, the first married and died childless, and then the second, and the third married her, and so on in the way all seven died childless. And finally, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had married her. And Jesus said to them, Those who belong to this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of a place in that age and in the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Indeed, they cannot die anymore, because they are like angels and are children of God, being children of the resurrection. And the fact that the dead are raised, Moses himself showed in the story about the bush, where he speaks of the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now he is God not of the dead, but of the living. For to him, all of them are alive. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So on Wednesday, I led the worship service at Lexington Independent Living. And I asked the congregation that was gathered there a question. One of those, the most philosophical of science kind of questions. And so people weighed in on different sides. And then I was surprised that later that night, on Wednesday night, while sitting around a a table at town with some grade school kids and Tom Wolfe, and we were sharing some riddles back and forth, a grade school kid leaned over and asked me the same question this deep and philosophical question. At night, we had it over pancakes, as all good philosophical questions should be posed because it was breakfast for dinner night. Everyone was wearing pajamas, and that question was asked, which came first, the chicken or the egg? At Lexington, I asked them to weigh in and say, which one do you believe came first, the chicken or the egg? So I'm going to ask you, which came for who thought the chicken came first? And how many people thought the egg came first? And how many people say, yes? Uh huh. <laughs> so between the services, Gordon Hlavanka came up to me. He goes, The chicken came first, and I can prove it. It's in scripture, because God said, God made the birds of the air and told them to go and multiply. So if you believe Gordon, you can go that way. The question of the chicken and the egg, it seems a strange question. But in the Gospel of Luke, we have another kind of a strange question that comes from the Sadducees. Now, At the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is teaching in the temple, and he tells people of the good news. And that's when the chief priests and the scribes, they come to him, and they ask him a a question at the beginning of the chapter. They ask, by whose authority are you teaching? Jesus replies with a question. Did the baptism of John the Baptist come from heaven, or was it of human origin? Now, they were unable to answer that question. 
So they sent spies to try to entrap Jesus. And so they posed another question to him. They asked him about paying taxes to the emperor. Jesus asked for a denarii, a coin of the time, and he asked whose picture is on the denarii and whose title. And it, they said, the emperor. And Jesus said, then give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to God the things that are God's. And they weren't able to trap him by what he said, and not being able to do so, they became silent. That's when another group of leaders, the Sadducees, step up to take their turn. They see that the Pharisees are silent, and so now the Sadducees see that they have a chance. Now, they're the group that we encountered a, a few weeks ago when we heard from the book of Acts the Sadducees who had imprisoned Peter and John for preaching about the resurrection, the Sadducees, they didn't believe about the resurrection. They did not believe in the resurrection, and that is why they are sad, you see. Right? Remember that? So somewhere between 200 and 100 B.C., the Pharisees and the Sadducees began to disagree over beliefs in the resurrection. And they became two opposing factions within Judaism. The Sadducees studied the first five books of the Bible known as the Torah, so Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And they claimed that there was no mention of the resurrection of the dead in those books. Now, the Pharisees emphasized that the written Torah needed to be kept up to date with the oral tradition of the Torah, with new beliefs that emerged from the Psalms and from apocalyptic literature, such as the book of Daniel. Now, by the time the Gospel of Luke was written, which was about 80 to 90 in the Common Era, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were at odds with one another. So now trying to test Jesus, the chief priests and the elders of the Pharisees are now silent. They couldn't couldn't do it. And so the Sadducees see their chance and they step up to the plate. They ask Jesus this particular question about marriage and the resurrection, something that they don't themselves believe in. And they're trying to trick Jesus. The the intent of their questions, as Pastor Kathy said, they were trying to trick Jesus, to say the wrong things, to make him look foolish, and to make onlookers realize that maybe he's not so trustworthy or knowledgeable. So they tell the story of seven brothers and a woman, all of whom have died, and they asked, which ones are married in the afterlife? This this made-up scenario is meant to make fun of Jesus, but he takes this seriously, and he answers their questions. Now, you know, this life, with all of its twists and its turns, it can be confusing, but this life is a blessing. We all experience different things. Some of those things are absolutely wonderful, and other experiences are not so great. It is part of being human. We have both remarkable joys to celebrate and we have some truly overwhelming struggles to contend with in this life. Throughout our lives, we make friends and we grow friendships, but we also lose friends and friendships become broken. Some people will find someone to spend the rest of their life with and they'll join them in marriage and others decide not to. God blesses each one of us with this life, with all of its twists and its turns. Now Jesus reminds the Sadducees, and he is reminding us in this passage as well, that eternal life is not simply a continuation of this life, where we continue to struggle to figure it all out where we spend most of our time focusing inward on our own selves, looking at ourselves on selfies and everything else. Instead, Jesus reminds us that 
eternal life means that we are reunited into the heart of God, which is eternal and good. One writer put it very well. He said, the decisive point that Jesus is making to the Sadducees is that death is the end of many things, but it is not the end of everything. Our death is not the end of God. When we die, we finish the race to accumulate more. We end the cycle of building up our own egos. We stop chasing after the illusion of perfection. We end all the things that we started and never finished and never will finish. As the saying goes, you can't take it with you. Death changes our relationships. Marriages do come to an end. But for those still living in this world, those memories of loved ones can often continue to be cherished and warm our hearts. That relationship with our loved one changes. We all know that death changes many things, but our death does not change God. It does not mean the end of God. God calls us to love one another. We are called to attend to those that are in need. We call to work together to improve the condition here on earth, to celebrate the gift that God has given us in this life, and to share those gifts with one another. Jesus is encouraging us to build each other up and not to tear each other apart. When I read between the lines in the gospel lesson today, I imagine Jesus giving out a deep sigh before answering. Why do we try to make one another look foolish? Why do we try to deceive one another? Our work on earth here is to share the peace of Christ with each other. Our purpose on earth is to glorify God and to enjoy God forever. When we help those in need, when we provide shelter to those who have none, when we feed the hungry, when we promote God's just and good ways, when we welcome one another and lift each other up in love, God is glorified. That's what we're to do in this world. In his answer, Jesus reveals what is yet to come. In heaven, all are considered to be like angels and children of God, being the children of the resurrection. This is such an amazing and radical statement. In heaven, there won't be the social political strata that we try to build on each other. There won't be those that are less than us or those that are greater than us. No more kings or queens, kings or queens, presidents, rulers, bosses, intimidators, as well as no one underneath us, no one above us, all loved by God. No more feeling like you're the last one picked for dodgeball. I hated that feeling. And sometimes I still feel that in this life. In death, we will be transformed and welcomed into the heart of God. We humans are not eternal, but God's love for us humans is eternal. Jesus talks about this age and that age. Some who belong to this age are married to one another, but those who are worthy of a place in that age neither marry or are given in marriage. All are reunited with God. So what does that look like? I don't have the answer. I can imagine I can use my own human understanding of this life to look forward to what that life will look like. But there's only one who comes back and tells us. It's Jesus who reminds us. So we don't know what that life will be. We don't know what the life before us was like. What was it like before you were born? Were you the chicken or the egg? 
Did you have someone? Were you the one couple that was destined to be together before all time? Did you meet your spouse somewhere before time? Were you destined to be the person that you are? Or does God welcome you into the world, guide you and continue to love you for who you are? I believe that's what God does. And I also believe that God sent Jesus into a particular time in history to open our understanding of how we are to call each other towards God, to love one another in this age, and to look forward to the age to come. Talking about that age to come, you've already received your invitation, and you've already accepted it. Your place is guaranteed. Your future is planned out for you. Jesus comes and tells us that God is the God of the living, that God is welcoming us, guiding us in this life, and welcoming us in the next. God invites you to live into the promise, knowing that even though you are finite, God is eternal. All your future plans are taken care of. All you need to do is to live this life and to live this life in a way that is pleasing to God. Hallelujah. Amen.